This image was made with a ray tracer that fit into less than 150 lines of C++. If that sounds impossible, stick around and let's look at how it works. I never thought something like this was possible, yet some guy on GitHub made it a reality. And he also wrote a blog post about it, so anyone can learn how ray tracing works. This here is an actual image from the ray tracer we're going to be looking at today. Now, this example is small, but packed with mathematics. I wanted to go more in depth but the video became very boring. So I decided to talk to you more about high level concepts of ray tracing here and if you'll be interested check out the article, the link is in the description. Alright, code time. As per usual, I'll scroll through the file first so you get a feeling of its shape. And don't worry if you don't know C++, the concepts are pretty much the same in all languages. Now first, let's set some foundations. We are working with a three dimensional space and the only two constructs we are really gonna use are points and vectors. And that's exactly why we have a vec3 struct for. It's nothing more than a struct with three numeric fields. Both points and vectors are defined with three numbers, x, y, and z. They represent the coordinates for a point and components of a vector. A point is pretty much self-explanatory, so let's not waste any time here, and we'll use vectors to indicate directions. So for example, these vectors here are all the same. The only difference is that they originate from different points. Then another thing is that vectors have a magnitude. This is a single number that is basically a length of a vector. So if this is a vector v, this is its magnitude and we'll write it out like this. And to calculate the magnitude you can use Pythagorean theorem, like this. That's also why this method norm is defined on our struct. Not really sure why it's called like that to be honest though. Another concept, to normalize a vector means that we make its magnitude 1. Essentially, we divide each component with the magnitude to get here. We make the length of a vector 1, because sometimes we only care about its direction, but don't care about the magnitude. Normalized versions of these vectors would look something like this. They would all have the same magnitude. This is also defined as a method on our struct, and it's called normalize. Yeah, I know. Then a dot product of two vectors relates to the angle between two vectors. This product produces a single scalar and we can calculate it like this. In code we use operator overloading for this. This essentially means that if we type out a product between two vec3 instances we actually perform a dot product. Right below we have a material struct. This one holds information about a surface and alongside it we have four predefined materials that will be used later on in the program. Then we have a sphere which is one of the object types that will show on our rendered image. You can see that it contains the required geometric properties as well as the material. These here are predefined spheres and light sources for our image. We can change coordinates and properties of these objects to influence how our end result will look like. Now with the boring stuff covered, let's scroll all the way down to our main function and start casting some rays. Our image will be represented using the frame buffer array and each element will represent a pixel. At the end of our main function, we'll store the result in a .ppm format, which we can then open with an image viewing program. Right, let's take a step back and look at how this looks like. We have a 3D scene which is composed of different spheres. We then have our frame buffer which is essentially a 2D canvas we want to view our scene through. We can look at it a bit like a film of an analog camera. So now what we're gonna do is, we're gonna say that we are looking from the origin of our coordinate system, so 0 0.000. And then for each pixel, we're gonna shoot a ray from our origin through the pixel and to infinity. We'll determine the color of the pixel based on what we hit, and if we don't hit anything, we'll just use a background color. So for example, for this pixel here, if we shoot a ray through it, we don't hit anything, so this pixel will use the background color. But if we take a pixel in the middle here, it hits one of the spheres and depending on which sphere it hit, we can determine the color of the pixel based on spheres material as well as the direction in which the ray bounced off of it. 
If we look at this for loop in our main function, this is exactly what we are doing. We calculate the components of a direction vector for each pixel, we normalize it, and then we call a function that casts a ray from our origin into the specified direction. Then we get back the color of the pixel which we use in our frame buffer. Easy, right? Well, I'm glad that you're still with me. Now let's look into this cast ray function and see what it actually does. Remember, this function is triggered once for a single ray, so we're just interested in one ray at a time here. What we need to do now is determine if our ray has hit any object, and if it did, where is the hit point, what is the normal of the surface it hit, and what is the material of that surface. As it happens, we have a function specifically for that, and it's called scene intersect, and it's located just above the function we are looking at now. This function takes our ray and uses all objects in our scene to check if it hit any. It then takes the object it hit that is the nearest to the origin of the ray and then also returns this object's material and surface normal. In our image we have only spheres and the checkerboard. This part here checks the checkerboard and this bottom one checks all the spheres we defined above. For an example in 2D view, this is a sphere and this is the ray we are casting. We are looking for this hit point here and the normal which looks like this. We use this ray sphere intersect function to help us achieve that. Again, we are not gonna go through all the mathematics, I strongly recommend that you look at the article I mentioned at the beginning if you are interested. If you understood the math basics, you shouldn't have problems with understanding that. At this point, just for illustration purposes, if we were to return just the color of the object or the background, we'd get an image that would look something like this. Now, this image doesn't look all that interesting. So the next thing we need to take care of is lighting and shadows. We do that in this very involved piece of code. And I'm gonna be honest, anyway I tried putting it, my explanation for this topic was crap, probably due to my lack of understanding. But anyways, I decided not to include that into the video, and I really really recommend that you check the article out for a better explanation. Overall, the lighting is handled by something called a Fong reflection model, and this image shows you how it combines three components to build one final result. The main extra inputs to this model are light source which we defined above and the materials of individual objects. When we apply this model to our scene in isolation, we get a result that looks like this. There are still two things left for us to handle, and that are refractions and reflections. First, we calculate direction vectors for each of them. Reflection is a direction light takes after bouncing off a surface, and the refraction is how light changes direction when passing from one material into another. Think about a pencil in a glass of water, for example. Reflection is determined using this simple function, while a refraction is calculated using a bit more complicated one that implements something called Snell's law. The theory behind it is pretty interesting, in fact it's so interesting that I'm too dumb to explain it to you, so I suggest you look it up. Anyways, after we have these two directions, we call the same cast ray function recursively for a few levels. By doing this we take the impact of other objects into account when calculating the color of the current pixel. And if we look below, these two color values are then taken into account when calculating the Fong reflection model which I mentioned earlier. And just for completion, here is the image of spheres without the checkerboard with this model applied. And here is the step by step process we took. One final thing, we take all of these different calculated color properties into account to produce the final color of the pixel. And if you remember how the main function looks like, these pixels are then used to stitch together the final image. And yes, that's it. Again, I really encourage you to check the original article out, since it covers concepts a lot more deeply. Anyways, let's run this thing. As we don't use any external libraries, we can just use this simple command to compile and then run the binary. Alright, our program now produced a file called out.ppm. If you use a tool that can represent this file as an image, it should look like this. If for nothing else, I hope I at least gave you the idea that ray tracing, as all other things, can be understood. The code for this example is also on my GitHub alongside other small examples which illustrate concepts like this. The link to this repository is in the description and each of these examples in the repository also has their own video here on YouTube. I know that my explanation probably wasn't the most clear, but I still hope that you enjoyed watching this video. If you did, please consider subscribing. Anyways. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again. Bye!